Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Constance Ndumela. I am the librarian here at Sol Plaki University. I am responsible for the School of uh, Economics and Management. Uh, I will be taking you through uh, the first part of the program today. Uh, before we go even further, I would like to, uh, for us to get a word of welcome and introduction from Ms. Uh, Molopiane. Ms. Molopiane is a, a, a director of uh, libraries at the University of the Free State. Over to you, Ms. Molopiane. Uh, good morning, colleagues. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, good morning, Jeanette. Yes. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Welcome to this very important event where we celebrate open science as part of our open access week. When we talk about open science, we talk about social justice. This is so important for us, especially the African continent, the richest yet the poorest continent. Open science is really a tool for us to elevate what we have, to take our own knowledge to the world, the African knowledge, our expertise as Africans, our resources, our indig indigenous knowledge as part of open science so that the globe should see what Africa really has. So open science is also one of the tools towards poverty alleviation because now knowledge is available for the world to see. It is so important for Pule, a first year engineering student who doesn't have resources and support to pursue his uh, first year engineering course. So open science will facilitate his knowledge, especially with the level of intelligence that he has to ensure that at the end of the day, whatever that Pule will come up with, the invention as a result of open science, something that is going to sort out the universe problem. So for me, open science is so significant, so important, so invaluable. Um, I'm going to acknowledge all the speakers who are here. I'm going to acknowledge Dr. Nokutula Mtunu, the Deputy Director of the Afri African Open Science Platform, or WASP. I'm going to acknowledge Ms. Monica Boland and Mr. George Murray, the Research Office from Solplaki University. I'm going to recognize Prof. Bangole Awuzi from Central University of Technology. I'm going to acknowledge <coughs> Mr. Hercules Combrink, Co-Director Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, University of the Free State. I'm going to acknowledge Professor Katin Kadivet, Co-Director Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, University of the Free State. I am also going to acknowledge Dr. Molapo Kobela, Vice Director Institutional Change, Strategic Partnerships and Social Impact, University of the Free State. And lastly, I will acknowledge Mr. Charlie Molebo, Deputy Director, Library and Information Services, University of the Free State. Colleagues, let me take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you as we hold hands and ensure as a collective that we fully embrace and implement and execute a open science for the best of our institutions collectively and where we spread it nationally, continentally and globally. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ms. Molopiane, for the words uh, for the words of welcome. Uh, without wasting uh, any time further, uh, I want to start now by introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, as Ms. Molopiane has also mentioned, we have in our midst uh, Dr. Nokutula Mtunu, 
she's here to present uh, on uh, African Open Science Platform. Uh, Dr. Nokutula prefers uh, just to be called Nox. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dr. Nogutula is the Deputy Director at the African Open Science Platform, hosted by the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Dr. Mkunu has a wealth of experience in academia outreach programs, the popularization of science and STEM with local communities. She was a senior researcher from the Agricultural Research Council in South Africa, in the biotechnological platform. She completed her doctoral degree at uh, DUT. She also served as the scientist in, in a number of international institutions, including USA, Sweden, China, and Malaysia. She is the first recipient of uh, the Young Scientist Program between China and South Africa. Over to you, Dr. Mkunu. Uh, thanks, Constant. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Can I just, before I start speaking, uh, can you give me rights to share, Constant? Because I can't share anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's hope uh, the team will sort you out, Doctor, quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Thank you again to everybody. Uh, I would like to acknowledge everybody uh, here. All the, I think the most important things are the people involved in, in information dissemination at this moment as librarians. I think uh, they will play a big, big role moving forward. Uh, but I'll also thank for the thank everyone for the invitation, Constant, um, uh, your director, and the three universities that come together. And and I, I really um, glad that people are starting to celebrate and 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 talk and have this conversation of in, in open science, especially universities. I think they'll play a, a big role. Uh, so let me try to share. Can, can everyone see my screen? Yes, you can do Yes. Yeah, uh, before I start, also I'd like to apologize. I'm currently in Benin, so uh, connection may not be best. So just let me know quickly if I'm talking to myself or or there's some, some things that, that, that are happening that I wouldn't know about. So the African Open Science is constant, as, as just alluded to, is, is a platform hosted by the NRF, uh, but it comes from a long, long vision so for, for many, many people who have put in through before it is here now. There's a lot of stuff that happened, so I will just quickly go through that, why we, we have this platform and, and what it looks to do or get involved in. So uh, sometime uh, in November last year, the UNESCO recommendation was um, agreed on in Paris by the 190 so member states to say that everybody agrees that open science now has to be a priority and, and, and they will do it. So I assure all member states, and it's the same thing I'm doing here in Benin, especially in West Africa, to say that it's, it's not an option at this moment. We have agreed to, to, to as member states in the UN, to, to participate in this new way of doing science. But besides that, it, it is a good way of doing science as um, it, uh, by the previous welcome speaker showed that it is actually a science for social justice, you see. So these recommendations came about with a lot of work for the past, 10 years or so, there's some uh, forward progress that had happened in open science that I will try to recapture. So the, before we start, I know there's a lot of, of confusion between open science and, um, and open access. So I will use the UNESCO definition of open science, which there is a lot of definitions and some of them are, are correct, but I'm using this as, 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 as our base. So basically, open science aims to make 
science, when again you science, we're talking hardcore science, your life sciences, engineering, but you including any type of science, all sciences, humanities, you name it, any type of work that happens globally as research in a science. So I know a lot of people, again, when we, we use the word science, they may generally lean towards uh, hardcore sciences. So the aim of this is basically to make science open, inclusive and equitable. So if you look at the definition, it aims to make all practices of science multilingual, a very ambitious thing. It needs to be open to knowledge, accessible, reusable for everyone, and by doing this, you'll be able to increase collaboration and sharing of information beyond what we think is the traditional way of doing science and the scientific community. So if we take the main aim in the statement of open science, it, the aim is to make science, information, research, whatever you name it under that umbrella, accessible, inclusive, and equitable. These are the three things, because if we can do this, then science will benefit society. We will not do science for the sake of doing science, but we will do it science for society. So there are many global trends that have started in open science. There is global, Global Open Science Cloud is the EOS uh, project in the US that, it, sorry, in Europe that looks at open science and how mostly targeted infrastructure. But what we think, what are the main imperatives for Africa with South Africa is included as a whole. So it's basically to make sure that the continent, the African continent, can have global or develop their own commons into solving continental and global challenges. And also we need to promote the best practices of open science that are already happening in, in, in the continent and look at their impact in the society. And at that point that we're looking at data, how do we share data, how the data is shared, and, and, and what does it mean when we take fair data and all these things? So Africa needs to, to define a little bit in their own context, what the, does that mean? And then open access and publishing. So I'll talk a bit more for, for the sake of today on this, but these are main pillars that open science look at. You look at collaboration, you look at uh, solve global challenges, look at how data is used, and then you look at uh, communication and publishing in, 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 in science. So the AOSP as itself with this background, so as I said, there's been a lot of work. We are currently around this year, 2022. So the conceptualization of, of this, uh, which happened between uh, different organizations, including the International Science Council. And then it, it, it looked at implementing um, the pilot phase of the African Open Science Platform. You had ASAF being involved in SA, trying to, to operationalize this pilot phase and code data, which is a subcommittee of the International Science. Council uh, uh, making a lot of, of, of technical input in, into the project. So by the year 2020, 2018, the operational uh, uh, of the African science platform started. But however, as we all know, throughout the years of 2020 and 2021, we had a little bit of a COVID situation. So there wasn't a lot of things happening there. But Right now we are in the implementation phase and, and um, deliverables and see how we can take this project forward. So I will talk to some of, of, of this implementation and deliverables in the context of open science. So the African open science platform, its vision and aim is basically to look, take the African scientists to the cutting edge of computer, of, of, of modern data 
intensive science and, and make sure these fundamental resources are used for modernization of society or for advancement of society. So we it will do this by addressing the African challenges and, and global challenges as a whole. So what we think is important is one, we need to have a federated structure of, of facilities. It could be e-facilities, it could be physical facilities and policies that will make this network of infrastructure works. And then two, we need to develop skills that are associated with handling of this data, data science, and we're envisioning a, a mostly a virtual uh, continental institute that, that will work in providing this capacity. And, and I think in this area of data science and, and AI and, and large data repositioning of, of libraries and librarians will play a big role into data and data stewardship and all processes that are involved in this. And also we want to promote collaboration within the African continent. So if we look at the work that is done in looking at collaborations between institutes, between internally in the continent and with the global north, it's a fascinating story that most scientists or most institu institution within the continent collaborate less with each other and more with the global north and a bit with the global south. And we aim to try and change the situation and have a lot of uh, continental collaboration within institute. And then of course, create a network of education and schools in data and information and have this type of open science and access uh, dialogue. So how does the African open science look at how doing this? So we have to have the main things happening there, your governance, the management of the platform, engaging with the stakeholders, operationalizing the platform and having all the activities and, 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 and looking at the impact by monitoring and evaluation the work we do. So we think that we have captured what I was talking about in, 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 in success point, what is our aim, who are our stakeholders, as I've said, and then what we aim to offer as, as, as I've alluded. So we really think that we need to consolidate and multiply the effort of different activities in Africa on open science and collaboration. And I think that OSP will provide doing this multiplication effect and networking and making sure we work cohesively in connecting the dots in all the different stakeholders or role players that are doing this work in, in Africa. So I, I, I think it is important to partner with different people, but I think uh, AOSP is positioned well uh, in partnering and, and fostering or connecting people you we don't really say you should connect with us, but I think we are building up a lot of stakeholder partnerships that we can connect other partners to 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 what we with other stakeholders that we work with into this into this type of work. So I will just pick up a little bit of work that has been done on open science as a whole in different areas in in our regions in Africa. There's a uh, Wakran, which is the West African uh, region of NRENS, educational NRENS, where they have started a project uh, called LifeSense, which is based uh, for library support for embedded NRENS services and e-infrastructure. So it's quite an interesting project. So what they look at in, in Western Central Africa is looking at all the sister regional research networks and how they can help countries work on repository uh, uh, um, establishment, uh, uh, software tools for, for, for this type of work, data sharing between with the countries, and what are the 
what is the required infrastructure that is associated with type of work. So it's quite a, a, a lot of work that is happening within this region. And I think it's something that each and every region can duplicate quite uh, relatively easy, but with some uh, resources that are required. As I've captured a bit, they're looking at the infrastructure that are, are, are NREN based or NRENs as they are made up of universities and institutes. So they're looking at hardcore infrastructure. They're looking also at working on policy and governance and leadership within these activities in open science and capacity building. So they're looking at a lot of training that are associated with these activities. And we are currently also collaborating with them and, and working on a, on a um, standing MOU into doing these activities with, with WACRA and bringing other partners into, into the, into the, into the, into these activities. So what have we been doing in the short term for the African Open Science? We are looking at rescoping where we are with the open science landscape in Africa. And we also want to make sure that we are making the AOSP visible and what it has to offer and the contribution to, it, to, 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 to open science. And we are making a lot of effort into meeting the stakeholders, These are some of the stakeholders stakeholders we've been currently meeting this this year and, and making sure that we are moving forward with with um, activities and programs that will be involved in open science so what is then the operational uh, framework for the platform we are making sure that we are setting deliverables or indicator what would be the impact of the platform which should be published uh, is soon we've also uh, published uh, five notes calls. So the African Open Science looks to have uh, physical notes in the five regions of Africa to that will carry out certain work of, of open science, but in their region. There's a call also for the governing council of the open science that is will close soon and the announcement will be made by December. We're also working and prioritizing resource mobilization to make sure that the African open science is sustainable. We've also been working with different partners in different regions in Africa to start policy development. These are the countries that we've been working with, uh, especially in, in West Africa, Ivory Coast. We've uh, had a lot of workshops on drafts of, or, or, or thinking about draft of the open Open science policy in South Africa, we've been involved quite a bit, although it was it's quite an advanced stage. Also with the East Co Economic Block, all those countries listed there, we are looking at um, starting frameworks for their policy development. And then in North Africa, we are also starting workshop on policy development uh, as of next week, in which will be a workshop based in Egypt. We are also involved in the open access project. There's, there's a lot of work going on with the International uh, Science Council task team on opening the record uh, project, which looks at dialogue with publishers and, and how we can really make science communication really open. And we've been working with our own partner, a very supportive partner, ISC, under code data, into looking at open data, training, capacity development, and, and data schools for, for, for working uh, open data and, and open science. So these are some of the upcoming events for open science that we are planning. So one of them, we are planning to have an open day, a whole side event with UNESCO at the World Science Forum, which is happening in South Africa on the 7th. We're also working with the Ubuntu Net Alliance, which is uh, uh, an alliance of Southern and Eastern African emirates. 
We are running a library uh, repository workshop with tools and training for one day before the conference. So these are type of activities that we want to involve ourselves in, especially when it comes to open access. There are some projects that are associated with open data and health. We have a, a, a $5 million funded project with UCT that will look at open data uh, associated with Africa, which uh, the African Open Science is a partner in it. So for the sake of today, I put specific slides that talk to open access and, and, and publishing. So open access, as we know it now, where it's pay to publish, is, is a model that really doesn't talk to open access. It's, it's, a, it's something that we really need to think about and what does it mean for the researcher and what is, does it mean for, for the continent? I had an experience just recently. Uh, last week, I spoke to, to a, a, a professor from Burkina Faso that is has a, a paper that has been accept, accept, accepted in a, uh, with the publisher and the impact factor. Again, there's another thing up for, dis, uh, for discussion of eight, but they are asking him $10,000 to publish the paper. So this is interesting that he has to at least to pay close to uh, one hundred and eighty thousand to 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 publish a paper. Is is this open access? Is this really what what it means to make scientific information available for the larger community? Or just the basic research com community. So for, for the open science to work, open access or open communication, we really need to think about the new models of publishing. Again, it, the new models have to take into account quality, inequality in this. We need to think about general democratization of science. So if you look currently, it has been well known that the current models of publishing or publishers, although we think it has scrutiny, it has, I mean, PA reviewed, but it's always biased towards a certain group because they are based there and the the composition of the of the of people who do the peer review are of this bias towards accepting publication from from certain parts of the world so we need to think really how then for the developing world which most of africa is how what are the key benefits of a true open access not pay to access or pay to publish models. But at this base of all this question sits, what are the research assessments and incentive for researchers in order for them to go into this type of, of, of science communication? I won't call it publication, I won't call it science communication because then it differs how you define a uh, research output for a researcher. Is it communication or are we just talking paper? So when we look at the current models of publishing, you, we are talking now where you look at your academic impact. Again, when we go back to the introduction of this meeting, we want social justice, we want social impact. But what has been shown currently is that most of the academic outputs or papers or manuscripts are geared towards academic impact. So I am a researcher, I'm in genetics, I write a paper in genetics that all my colleagues in genetics agree if it's correct or not, it's acceptable to publish. You walk on the street, on the plant, maybe I worked on, do you know who is Dr. Nokchulam Kun who worked on cannabis? No, 
because the communication that I do is for a selected few. So that impact that we have started to look at, the citation index, the impact factor, the age index, all these are relatively one type of metrics and are flawed because I could have written a paper that every researcher in the field hates and they have cited numerously to say this paper is bad, but I have a good citation, which the age index will go higher because my paper has been cited numerous times, but it's a negative citation. So we really need to think, what is the goal of publishing, of communicating our results? So this is where we need to think about comprehensive impact. So I am not, again, let me make it clear. I am not saying that scientific publishing as we know it now should go away completely. It has its role to play where we communicate in community of practice what we're doing, but it must not make a big chunk of our everyday life as researchers. Our day, everyday life should be mostly focused on making science to have an impact in our society. That also means communicating this impact to our communities, not only being completely absorbed into writing publication for only our community of practice. And this design agreed, they will be complex and we need to rethink. We need to think alternative metrics into really understanding what is impact that we ask from our academics or researchers. And also when we then ask this, what are the rewards or incentives for the researchers to get involved into this? If I want to be a professor or an academic needs to be promoted. It is clearly stated that you need 10 research publication and, 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 and some community engagement. This is what they will aim for. They will give you 10 publications. So, but if we say we need certain communication that shows that you've had an impact in the society and we think what does that mean? And then we reward the researchers based on that. They will then think differently. We need to have uh, practices that change the behavior and in institutions. Yes, government will play a role, role, but universities have a bigger role to change the way or the, 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 the behavior of researchers by looking at their policies and incentivizing people who do research. Because I will state again, if we do not change this, this new promotional and incentive policies, the most important stakeholders in open science, the researcher who creates the data and deposits the data and uses the data that is available will not participate in open science. And then open science will be a failed project because we have stuck to the way we reward and incentivize uh, and researchers. This is because it is just simple. We all know this is academics. Academics, you want professorship, you want to have certain amount of promotion of success. You need to have incentives and rewards. And right now that means publishing in high impact journal, looking at patents, HI index, graduating students, and that's everybody looking at that. But we need to change this. We need to change the situation. We need to ask ourselves, how much do our researchers contribute to data that is useful for the society, that is useful for the community of, of practice? We could change the way maybe cite data that produces publication the way we cite research, ask our researchers for an award or an incentive, you need to deposit a certain amount of data. And each 
different area of science or community of practice will define what it means for their data sets. What are the rules and how to go forward? How much of science communication do you do for the community? How much of really impactful project are we as researchers doing to the community? Again, impact doesn't mean only novelty, it means changing the way our society and making it better, making science works for social, for social justice. So as, as my final comment, if we, if we acknowledge the producers or the knowledge producers refuse or reluctant to adopt open science, it will fail. It will fail. And we need to think as most researchers and scientists, their data is their career. They are dependent on publication. And But if we change and say that there is other ways to get into a career movement, not only by publication, then we will foster an environment that will allow people to get involved into this open science project via looking at the pillar of open science, communication, and, and publishing. So I'll stop there and, and, and thank everyone. These are the partners that we're working with and we continue adding new partners into, into the project. And uh, these are my contacts. I will leave them with constant and I'm happy to engage with, with a, a, anyone in this meeting or outside. And at that stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Knox. Uh, can we show a thumbs up for appreciation of Dr. Knox's beautiful uh, and informative presentation? Yes. Uh, I also find it very informative, uh, Doctor. Once more, thank you. If I can uh, parallel with you, uh, one thing that I take home from your presentation is that uh, the culture of doing uh, scientific research is being challenged. Uh, the traditional ways of doing uh, science uh, are, are really in question here, especially in the context of, of, of South Africa. We need, as you tabulated in your presentation, to see more of collaboration uh, uh, and dissemination of that uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, if researchers are, are doing research, it doesn't help the situation or it doesn't solve the global problems if all of that research is, is hidden behind uh, the paywalls. Only those who have access can have access to that knowledge. So then it means uh, uh, the, the global problems, like we are talking today about the climate change and the global warming. And for instance, like yesterday, we were talking of COVID. How do uh, people in communities reach out to that kind of knowledge to understand how to, to solve the problems that we have? Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. It is promising. I'm listening to you in a librarian's perspective. I think uh, there is future. All we need is to talk to one another. We need to communicate. We need to collaborate so that uh, we have uh, a better future. Uh, I'm going to take this moment uh, to the audience. This is time now for, for questions. If you have burning questions for our presenter here, uh, you can raise your hands. I'm going to take the first three people uh, who wants to ask questions. We can also use the chat box uh, to, to have comments and conversations going forward. But colleagues, help me out also to see hands if I, I'm unable of the first three burning questions to Dr. Mkunu. Thank you. For now, I'm unable to see uh, hands. Colleagues, do you think you have questions for Doctor before she 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 runs out of our screens? 
In the meantime, Doctor, can I ask you? I see your research focus also has uh, something to do with COVID, but then it's explained in more scientific terms that I'm unable to understand. Can you uh, maybe maybe put it in 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 lay format for me to understand or for us to understand uh, your research focus uh, recently? I see your hand, uh, Mr. Zungu. Let's just allow Doctor to answer to my question first. Yeah, it it was by coincidence. I would say that I got into COVID research. As you know, I was at Agricultural Research Council, so we really didn't do a lot of human. We don't do by our mandate. We didn't do a lot of human-based research, but because it, I was in the biotechnology platform, which really is a genomics platform in disguise, we we were asked to help out to, to alleviate the load of COVID testing within Gauteng. So we re did start uh, doing work on diagnostic for COVID with NHLS in Gauteng. So we were doing quite a, a few samples per day. So in that in in the same time, the Walter Research Council was doing a lot of wastewater surveillance of COVID, and we were asked to get involved uh, into doing this, into monitoring. COVID and we added other few bacterial diseases in the project. So we're really using a genomic surveillance tool in wastewater treatment. So we were doing a lot of water systems in Pretoria and Joanna municipality. And we did some collaboration with uh, the, the KZN uh, municipality and the, 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 the water chair of research that sits at, at, at DUT. So that, that, that was my involvement into creating, a, a, trying to create as early warning a system as possible with when the, the, the COVID um, epidemic was at, its, was at its height. All right, thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you for that elaboration. I see uh, the hands are up. I'll start uh, with the first uh, hand up. That was from Mr. Zungu. Mr. Zungu, can you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question to Dr. Noktula? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Constance. Uh, good morning, Doc. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the presentation uh, and also because it's talking to us uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a African uh, citizen. So I would like to uh, to find out, uh, Doc, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, common challenges that you uh, that you 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 have uh, experienced as you as you are uh, pushing this uh, agenda of Africa uh, African Open uh, Science. What were those uh, challenges? Uh, I'm asking the question because uh, our continent is uh, it's a uh, big uh, and also uh, deep rural. And then, uh, in terms of uh, reaching uh, the real uh, community, uh, so uh, maybe if I'm making uh, that as an example, so what, what were the were the most common challenges that you have experienced as you are pushing uh, the African uh, open access? Uh, thank you, uh, Doc. Uh, I think I I, I will. Uh... I mean, as I said before I started, I'm in, I'm in Benin. So we have a lot of collaborations that are here, but uh, I think there's a lot of, um, because Africa is not uh, homogeneous. So the solutions for the, for the problem is, are very different from each region. Because when I talk to stakeholders, for example, here, they find that although we are talking about access to publishing, they are talking to language barriers to publishing because we are from the English speaking country. So that for us is not a problem. For them, it's a major problem that most of the publication are in English, not in French. So just even the accessible publications are not enough for them to pass that barrier 
of of actually enriching their research. So it is quite interesting. And I think some of the challenges, like, yes, we talk about open access publishing. I remember I talked to, to that particular colleague of mine who said that this publication requires $10,000 for, for, uh, for APCs. So, I mean, in South Africa, some people are able to pay these APCs, but in, in some of the African countries, it's just simple and head of the $10,000 is the whole money to run her research for a whole year. So some of these challenges are very different. Some of them are, are, are similar, but the scale is different. So in Africa, I think the biggest challenge, we should not think that the open science initiatives or the solutions will be the same. They will be very different and will mean different things for different people. And this is what we have to come into grips with and come into understanding. And people will have different priorities to, to, to what they want to tackle in open science. Open science is a very complex thing we must acknowledge because just talking about open access that we are talking about today is complicated in itself because then you break it into communication and the reward system and 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 what does those all thing mean so each person my 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 thing is that take what you think is a priority for each country and each institution at, at the institutional level and make it work and little by little it 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 will come through so if we take examples of people who are expect in the field of open science like the European Open Science Cloud, which was started around 2010, and I speak to these colleagues every day, they still not sure exactly where they are going. And in general, yes, Europe is not homogeneous, but the way they work is mostly closely and is, is easily could be transferable from one country to the next. But in Africa, this is simple, relatively not true. So we really have to think what 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 do you want to do with with open science and then each country really has to think that what is this imperative and what solution will need to happen the other i think the most important thing yes we talk about social justice we talk about the the, the obvious benefits of open science but Let's talk about how to do that, how to implement social justice. What does it mean to citizen science? What do we mean when we say we want citizens to be involved in science, truly take ownership? We need to envisage and have practicalities. And we need a lot of case studies to talk about this and see how it works. And again, it likely will not be the same going from one place to the next. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Doctor. You said uh, a mouthful there. Uh, second hand up uh, for a question is from Ms. Takato. Uh, Ms. Takato, can you just unmute yourself and uh, direct your question to Dr. Knox? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And thank you, uh, Dr. Nkunu for, or Dr. Knox, as you prefer to be called, um, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation, um, and particularly looking at these issues of open access in terms of publications coming from a university. Um, partly of, of what I wanted to, to state or to, to, um, to comment on, you touched on in your previous um, uh, response uh, to the first question. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on the issue of, of rewards and incentives uh, for our researchers, uh, but particularly when looking at issues of promotion, where as a university sector uh, in South Africa, we really do focus much on academic impact and not much is done in terms of or is, is, is promoted in terms of societal impact, as you as you've put it. Uh, or comprehensive uh, impact. And um, when we even look at our national evaluation systems, 
whether it be uh, through the DHET uh, um, output um, uh, system where universities are ranked based on the publication um, um, outputs that they have. Uh, and even looking at the NRF, yes, the NRF maybe ratings would, would, would consider issues of, of societal impact, but um, really mostly at, at the high level of scientists where that is considered. So I guess my comment and, and maybe something for us to think about as a sector is how do we as a nation uh, start elevating um, um, the, the, the issues of, of societal impact and putting value to it uh, such that uh, from a national level, um, and it's difficult for one university to start pushing it or for us to do it in, 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 um, uh, on our own, in our own individual capacities. But when at a national level uh, is looked at uh, to, to see societal impact, and as you've said in Europe, uh, the UK system, the, the research evaluation framework does put a lot of emphasis on, on societal impact. Uh, and so this is something that we need to, to look at and to think about. Um, and, um, you know, we talk about decolonizing uh, um, uh, higher education. Maybe these are some of the aspects that, that will come into the discussion of, of decolonizing. Um, higher education. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Knox, for that. It was quite informative. Yes, thank you. And I, I, I think you must uh, uh, keep an eye out that the, probably the NRF Open Science Framework will come out at, at for South Africa, which will talk to what is asked for, for from the researchers when they are using public funds and uh, in, in participating in to, into open uh, science framework. And also there is a framework that's probably gonna touch on the impact. What do we now mean when we say we are we assessing impact? I think these are important. So if we if we have these documents and, and I think then institutions or universities can start making their own internal frameworks um, into looking at, at open science and impact together. We have also started conversation with USAF where, where all the universities speak to really think about how we can work open access and, and all these open science things, and then talk to the upper university structure in the long run into having a cohesive uh, plan within within in, in the South African setting, which is, is a different setting. But again, in other countries that we're talking to, we still implore universities to try to do their best as they can. Country policies or departmental policies have a big role to play, but universities at their macro level, at their micro uh, level, can start something as quickly as possible. Thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Ms. Menya, for, for raising that up. Uh, really, as we commemorate uh, the International Open Access Week, uh, we need to extend our invitation to the policy makers, uh, to the funders, uh, to the government, uh, to the researchers to come on table and we have these kind of, of discussions and awareness. Uh, we'll move over into our program. Um, now I'm going to introduce to you. Uh, okay, I'm going there right now. I'm going to introduce our second speaker on the program. Uh, her name is uh, Ms. Takato uh, uh, Simenya. She is uh, the director uh, of the Solplat University Research Office. Just to give you a short bio, uh, uh, Mr. Kato Simenya holds a master's uh, in business leadership degree from the University of South Africa. And she is pursuing uh, her PhD where her research focus is on knowledge translation within the South African research ecosystem. Uh, like I mentioned, she is uh, our uh, research office director at Sol Plagi. 
She previously worked at the South and African Research and Innovation Management Association, that is Sarima, as a project specialist. Prior to this, she was the research office manager at uh, Sifako Mahato Health Science University. Mahato has also worked as a part-time research management consultant on various projects uh, within Sarima, DHET, and the University of Pretoria. She experiences gathered uh, from working across disciplines over the years. She has gathered experiences, right? and has helped her out to develop a good understanding of the growing field of research management. And she is passionate to see the practice grow into a fully recognized profession across South Africa. Uh, although we are two minutes ahead of the program, I would like to hand over to you, Ms. Semenya, uh, to share to us your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just confirm that my screen is showing? Yes, correct. Okay, I'll just switch on my video for a short while so that um, you can just have a, um, a look at the person who is speaking on the other end. As I've been introduced, my name is Takato Semenya, and I'm just going to do a very short presentation based on our university um, and how we are beginning um, uh, in open science. Uh, we are fairly new as a university. Uh, we are just celebrated our eighth year um, in existence. So we're one of the uh, three new universities that were opened um, in the pre um, in the post democratic um, uh, South Africa. So I'm just going to put my presentation on slide mode. I hope that that is that. Okay, so this is the presentation outline. I'll just go briefly through our strategic plan 2020 to 2024 as a university, and then just touch on openness um, in research at, at SPU in terms of um, what is happening for us to, to promote uh, open science. Um, our strategy 2020 to 2024, so we are in the middle of the strategy as a university, and our vision um, as so likely is that we are a university or we want to see ourselves being a university which is critically engaged in learning, research and development while enhancing democratic practice and social justice in society. And I've just highlighted the, um, the statements of uh, democratic practice and social justice because this was really highlighted uh, by the first two speakers in terms of what, when we talk about open science, um, what the the drive and the and the, the the aim is, it's really about social justice. And as a university, this is our our uh, um, our vision as well. So as a university, we need to figure out what do we mean by social justice when it comes to uh, promoting openness um, and open science, as has been said, is quite broad um, in, its, in its concepts. Uh, so we have five goals. Um, goal number one being that we want to be research active and prioritize niches within a supportive institutional environment and culture. Goal number two is to deepen the academic program and its orientation to quality teaching. And goal number five is about community engagement as a scholarly activity. Now I put these three goals, goal one, two, and, and five, um, as part of the three pillars that most universities and many universities are founded upon. Um, and these have been our strategic uh, goals and our strategic goals as a university. And they are underpinned by goal number three and goal number four, which is to be a digitally empowered university. And goal number, number four is about financial sustainability. Um, so that is our um, strategic objectives and goals as so like the university. Um, I'm just gonna uh, run over this one here because I want to focus on the research uh, goal, which is becoming research active and prioritize niches. And these are the strategies that have been formulated for us to become research active 
It was the, uh, the establishment of a research office, which we started in 20, the end of 2019. So we're just about to finish three years having a research office. Um, we, are, we need to develop research and supervision uh, capabilities, establish strategic research partnerships, develop research themes and centers and mobilize research, research funding. Now within that um, is uh, our research values, uh, which we espouse as a university. I'm not gonna go through all of them, we've listed them there, but I just highlighted uh, some that I believe really speak to this concept of openness, open science or open access um, as we're talking about. And that is that we, we uphold the value uh, that publicly access, that our research outputs must be publicly accessible and that we promote cross-disciplinary, inter-institutional and international collaborations. And um, I've also highlighted uh, the value of upholding best ethical standards and integrity, because I believe that um, is something that, um, that really underpins um, 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 openness or anything else that has to do with research and the academic uh, project. Now, um, I thought of including these conceptual constructs um, as part of this, um, of this presentation. And I, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Knox kind of touched on these when she talked about, about openness um, and that openness, it's about social justice. And when we talk about social justice, we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about uh, um, uh, equity, uh, we're talking about justice. And as a university, we use these conceptual constructs in how we look at capacity development for both our students and staff members. And I thought these are actually quite important to, to include in the talk about openness and how we promote, or we would like to promote openness uh, as a university, that we need to think about access, we need to think about inclusion, and we need to think about success. Now, the way that these concepts are captured here, they're mainly looking inward in terms of our staff and student support services. But we need to then take these outwards. You know, how do we promote access uh, for the communities that we are working with in terms of the knowledge that is produced from the university and how knowledge is produced? And I think that's one of the things that also uh, Dr. Knox touched on. When do we actually start including the community in, 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 in the research life cycle? Uh, because in most cases, we talk about um, including the community or community engagement at the end of the research uh, process, where we've, we've, we've come up with a problem, we've done the research, now we're communicating and disseminating uh, um, uh, the results of the, of the project. But really, when we look at community engagement and community involvement in the research pro, uh, um, the life cycle, the community needs to be included from the beginning, because when we're saying that we're solving uh, and looking at solving um, uh, life problems, we need the community to help us to think what are the problems that they are facing. We need policymakers to help us to know what are the gaps that they're experiencing in terms of policy and how do we, um, as, as in the academic sphere, come together and put our minds together uh, with society to be able to come up with, with research problems that can be looked at. And so the solutions will be more uh, applicable uh, than if we're doing it in isolation. So that's the concept construct of, um, of access um, and as well as inclusion. How inclusive are we um, you know, to community and not only community, but within academia? Um, as well, uh, how inclusive are we for students as well in terms of the knowledge that is produced within universities? Um, and here we have our, as our third construct, the uh, construct of success. You know, how do we then say that we have been successful? And so how do we measure uh, what, what we have done and say that we have been successful in promoting openness uh, um, in our universities. So um, these are really cons constructs that we've used in capacity development, but they can be constructs that we can use in terms of looking at openness for the, for the university. 
Um, as a university, we've just recently, you've seen there one of the, uh, the, the strategic objectives was to set research themes. We've just the um, research in visual, we, we looked at priority research themes, and these are the three that we've looked at uh, considering our, our geographic location as a university, the communities around us, and, and considering the size of our universities. We really want to be known um, for something. So in as much as we are contributing to the research ecosystem, but we also want to stand out and known, be known to be set apart for something. And these are the three themes, data sciences, heritage studies, and uh, desert studies or arid zone studies. I included these here because looking at the theme for the, for the week uh, this year, which is open, um, open science for climate justice, um, I, I really think that our research themes really touch on the issue of climate justice when we're talking about desert uh, or arid zones, even data sciences that can be used to look at uh, climate, um, climate research or climate change research. And therefore, we need to now start looking at how do we promote openness when we focus on our priority research themes as stated um, in the slide. Now, looking at some of the um, uh, work or that we're doing in terms of openness in research at, at SPU, um, we're starting off first by looking at our policy on research that we have as a university. We are not explicit, and, and maybe that is something that we need to look at uh, in terms of our policy. And I'm, I'm glad that the framework, the national framework uh, on open science will be released soon. I know that there are national roadmaps um, um, from other countries. So we need to also be explicit. We talk about, as our, I mentioned in the research values, we talk about our output being publicly accessed. So. The, the, the concept is there, but it's not explicit in terms of linking it to the various concepts of open science, which can be open data, open review, uh, open access, and then all the other concepts that, that go into it. Um, we talk about it from the university's uh, standpoint, and we talk about it from the researcher's standpoint in the, in the policy on research. We also have uh, um, support structures that we have in terms of research publication. And in our research publications guide, we do provide quite sufficient information on open scholarship and open science and the different constructs that go under open science. And this is a way, again, of promoting awareness to our researchers and of encouraging our researchers to look into it. And we also provide internal funding for article processing charges. And, um, you know, this, this, this um, uh, discussion will always come up. Um, as we know that uh, article processing charges do not necessarily, uh, are not necessarily the same as open science, but we know that most of the open access journals do charge article processing charges, and it, it has been touched on um, by uh, Dr. Knox and some of the comments that I read as well, that the, the ridiculous amounts uh, that some of the publishers are really expecting our uh, academic take into consideration the issue of inclusion. So they become exclusive uh, for many of, of our African researchers. Um, looking at our ourselves as so black university, um, as I said, we're quite new. We're on a different funding model from the other universities, so we do not receive the publication uh, subsidy as other universities does. So we're really dependent on the council controlled funds for us to be able to support our researchers uh, for APCs. And it's a very small pot and it's growing less and less every year. Um, and we have seen, you know, um, um, charges of about 900, uh, 900 US dollars um, and we do encourage our um, our researchers to say, look, most of or some of the publishers are willing to consider discounts uh, for people coming from LMICs. Uh, but we're finding that uh, some of the publishers now are focusing on the low income countries and not the middle income countries, which South Africa is now considered as a middle income country. And therefore, um, our researchers would then not... Um, 
um, would then not get the discounted uh, APCs. But I know that with the, the libraries are looking at um, really doing quite a concerted drive uh, at approaching uh, these big publishers to say, please, can you consider lowering the APCs for our researchers? Uh, so that is some of the, the support that we're, that we're considering, but we need to look at how sustainable um, is it for us to continue supporting the, these large uh, APCs um, for open, um, um, open access. So do have an institutional repository. I know that uh, with the director for libraries, we've uh, been talking about the possibilities of, of an institutional repos uh, data repository and also looking at open data repositories with other universities as well. Um, this is just to show um, our DHGT publication units count. It's quite minimal, comparatively speaking, in the sector, but we are growing. Um, and um, this is one of the ways as well that we're promoting um, openness. When we're looking at our um, uh, university publications, uh, we do not yet have the sophisticated software that will do the analytics in terms of the open uh, um, the, the the publications that our our researchers are having in open um, access journals. But just looking at the DOAJ lists, how many of our our staff members are publishing in DOAJ list, which DHT um, introduced as an approved list. And so for 2021 and 2022, we're almost at a similar percentage of 17% of our researchers are publishing in, in, in the DOAJ list. I know that um, some of the uh, publications in Scopus and Web of Science and the other indices are also open access. So we need to explore and look at which of those are open access so that we can have a, a real picture of, of where our academics are publishing and how many or what percentage is publishing in open access um, uh, journals. Uh, also, the issue of collaboration is also something that touches on openness as well. And we're seeing really, when we're looking at our publications, we're seeing that a good percentage, I think it's over 75% of our academics are publishing collaboratively, meaning that they are working in collaborations. And most of these are with external uh, people, um, uh, national and international people. And so that is also something that we're doing uh, is to encourage collaboration and that encourages openness as well. Some of the ongoing work is to continue building awareness on openness as um, you said, looking at the various national roadmaps and looking at the national open science framework when it comes into play uh, that we promote internal uh, awareness um, for our, our researchers on this. And this one on dispelling myths and fears. Um, you know, Dr. Knox uh, uh, put it quite nicely in, in, I think it was her last slide, where she said that if the academics or the researchers uh, don't buy into openness, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, then it's gonna fail. Um, and so this is part of dispelling myths because we've seen that our academics have this anxiety and fear about sharing, um, whether it be sharing their data or sharing the, uh, the, the methodology that they use uh, or sharing uh, uh, um, just any outcome of their, of, their, of their research. There is a certain level of fear and that again is, is connected with the, with the idea of there is still competition uh, in the system. Um, for promotion, for, for various uh, uh, ratings and evaluations. So we need to dispel these myths and fears uh, of not wanting to share, of, or, of, of you know, fearing uh, to share uh, from our researchers. Um, and we continue to support initiatives for reduced APCs, as I said, through the, the, the library, uh, the, the National uh, Library Consortium, um, that uh, as they approach the publishers for uh, reduction, that we stand together with the sector, with the other universities to support the reduction of APCs for our researchers. And um, as I said, that openness goes together with ethics and integrity. So the promoting a culture of, of, of ethical conduct, uh, promoting a, a culture of integrity within research 
will go a long way as well in terms of promoting openness um, for research um, at so like and I suppose in any other platform or in institution. And that brings me to the end of my um, presentation. Um, I use this poster here that we recently had our student conference um, uh, for our postgraduate students. And I just really like what is uh, stated at the bottom that powering the future everywhere for everyone. And that for me really captures what openness is about. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Simenya. Uh, thank you uh, for taking us through into understanding uh, the SPU research office and the support that is currently doing. Uh, let me see thumbs up for Ms. Takatsu. Uh, it's time us for now, for, now uh, for us to, to, to take questions for Ms. Simenya. Uh, yes, I see hands up. I'm not sure now if it's it's thumbs up for Ms. Semenya or it's, it's the question time. Okay, let's do it again. Uh, now it's time for questions for Ms. Semenya uh, around her presentation. Uh, really colleagues, the goal here is around transparency, uh, transparency of the research processes uh, and the methods uh, that are used. Uh, we, we know that funding is what drives uh, research. The issue now here of the cost of uh, article processing fees. Uh, maybe it's a challenge for the St. Frisol also to look at. Maybe in future consider uh, uh, establishing their own uh, open journal system. The three, uh, the three directors. Uh, Dr. Sabello, uh, Mepeti, and uh, Ms. Molopiane, is it possible looking into the future? Because really now, if it's not uh, the publishing uh, system that is currently uh, working, if it's not sustainable, then it's not solving uh, the problems, uh, the current problems that we, we, we face in, in, in the globe as well. Okay, uh, any questions for Ms. Takatsu? Okay, uh, no questions. Uh, thank you once more, Ms. Takatsu. Uh, now I come to an end of uh, uh, my part in the program. I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Zungu to take us through uh, to the next slot in the program. Thank you very much. You were a wonderful uh, audience. Thank you and bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Constance, uh, for facilitating, facilitating our, our first uh, session. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Emmanuel Azu. I'm a, a librarian at uh, Central University of Technology in the Faculty of uh, Engineering Build and uh, Information Technology. Uh, my role uh, for today is to introduce our, our speakers. I will start by introducing um, uh, Professor Uh, uh, Bangoli Auzi, uh, that would be our first uh, speaker uh, for this session. Uh, professor Bangoli Auzi is an associate uh, professor in the Department of Build Environment, Build Environment uh, in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, Build and Information Technology at the Central University of Technology in Free State, uh, South Africa. He holds a PhD in the built environment, that is a construction uh, project management from the University of Salford uh, in UK and the MSc in construction project management from the Robert uh, Gordon University in Scotland. 
He's a, he's a rated researcher of the South African National Research Foundation, that is NRF. He has authored, uh, co-authored over 120 peer-reviewed publication comprising of 63 journal articles, uh, 56 uh, conference papers, five book chapters, and two books. Furthermore, a prof uh, has, has to his uh, credit, uh, three successful completed doctorate degree uh, supervisions and 10 successful completed master's degree uh, supervisions. Furthermore, he is currently an associate editor of the Build Environment Project and Assets Management, uh, which is known as a, a BPEM a journal. A Q1 journal published by the Emerald Publishing as well as the uh, Frontiers in the Sustainable Organizations. A special journal uh, published by the Frontiers uh, Publishing. He is also a member of a board of reviewers for the Springer uh, book series, that is Strategies uh, for Sustainability. His research interests lie within the re remit of, of the smart, sustainable, and uh, secular built environment knowledge uh, domain. He can be contacted uh, via his email on bauz at uh, cut.ac.az. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, Prof. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to share my slide now. Um, just let me know when you can see my slide. Yeah. Can you see my slide now? Yes, yes, uh, prof absolutely. I can, uh, okay. we can be able to see your slide. Thank you. Okay. Um, Challenge for that reason, yeah. the yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zungu, for the uh, wonderful introduction. I didn't expect it was going to be that long. <laughs> I was thinking it was going to be an abridged version. And um, thank you um, for the invitation to speak at this at this um, auspicious event um, to mark our Open Science um, Week. Here uh, between the three states, uh, between the so Black University, uh, Central University of Technology, as well as our uh, peers from the University of the Free States. So um, I'll start now. Uh, the outline of my presentation, which is titled um, Debunking Myths Associated with Open Access Publishing um, Perspectives from a Mid Career um, Researcher, would we'll start by um, with an introduction. To look at from the direction we're looking at understanding uh, open access publishing, what does it entail, and how did it come about? I would also be I'll also be trying to explore the benefits or to elucidate the benefits, disadvantages, and then share a little bit about my personal reflections um, uh, that I have I believe have been engendered by my uh, reliance or my desire to align my personal philosophies towards open access publishing in recent times and that for concluding. So as you can see, uh, Prof, uh, I'm not sure whether it's only on my side, we have uh, your screen has freeze. To drive society's quest for advancement, society's quest for resilience, society's quest for improved well being of the citizenry and increased productivity. So, we, it, we society expects us as researchers or as academics and as researchers to, to lead in this on the front to be in the frontier of the quest for sustainable futures. And this we must do by listening to society 
and by trying to integrate or incorporate societal virtues and, and tenets into what we do, both in, uh, in a transparent manner. As you can see, see that taxpayers have continued to fund this uh, public, to fund public universities, publicly owned universities, and as well try to uh, ensure that we have the resources that we need as universities to continue to develop knowledge and to become innovative or more innovative in what we do. This quest has led to a transition, or what I'll call a transition, across generations for universities. As you can see um, on the table on, on the right hand side there, that we've moved from the kind of outputs that are required from just merely professionals in the first generation universities to having professionals, scientists, entrepreneurs, and competitive local economy. So you can see that the relevance of what we do, the studies that we do, the research that we do on the local economy has become buttressed or elucidated in, in, in recent times. And again, these transformations have also, uh, I've just mentioned the universities, uh, as positioning uh, sorry. investors as- Sorry, you? Prof. Yeah, yes. Uh, I'm not sure the whether it's happening on my side. The, the slide has not uh, moved. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's, it's oh, uh, or I'm maybe the other colleagues slide. are experiencing that. Oh, I don't know. I'm on the second slide now. Can you see the second slide? Oh, yes, yes. No, side? thanks. It was on my side. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. You can okay. continue. Okay, that's fine. Sorry for that. So basically, uh, peer reviewed, and what I'm trying to say uh, is that these transformations that we've talked about have since positioned us as universities as critical players in the triple, quadruple, or quintuple um, helix models of innovation, as well as what we now term the university knowledge technology transfer um, ecosystems. One of such ways through which we, as researchers, disseminate uh, or engage with our local communities with our, the outputs of our research is through peer-reviewed uh, publications. However, access to these publications by the relevant stakeholders, not just within academia, but again in policy and, and in business communities, has remained limited due to barriers, the uh, access barriers, okay, which, which include high access prices and copyright issues. Uh, publishers, uh, because I work with some of these publishing houses, publishers have actually attributed the preponderance or the causes of those or this rising bar this barriers to the rising production costs and distribution costs that are associated with our, with, with trying to disseminate these publications to the relevant um, stakeholders. As such, like previous speakers have, have, have agreed, society is mostly deprived from benefiting from the novel work that we carry out as researchers in universities globally. And this is particularly the case in developing countries where the dollar denominated fees charged by some of these publishers for guaranteeing APC for uh, open access in the event that we want to go the gold access route have kept researchers and stakeholders at bay as a result of the exchange rates that are prevailing and poorly funded institutions and most of these clients. So it's, for the public, I think they would look at it as from the perspective of double dipping, where they look at, at the, the university why do they have to still spend more money on trying to provide uh, or to gain access to these publications or the outcomes of whatever research they have paid us to do or which they're paying the investors to do? And again, if we also look at the comparison, I'm carrying out a comparison between the degree of effort that has been put in by publishing houses on one hand and scholars on the other hand in bringing about new knowledge to society, okay, you we would notice and uneven relationship between both parties. For example, whilst publishers have profited from such scholarly uh, publications, disseminating them from a monetary perspective, scholars have relied on an assessment of the impact of their publications for self-gratification, or perhaps things that have to do with promotions and all that in the universities. If you look at the, if you look at the, 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 the table on the, on the other side, on the right-hand side, the article there, it would show you that, for instance, the rise in the prices of journal articles have outpaced inflation by 250% over the past 30 years. And, and, and this shows you that actually, yes, please. Sorry, this is Dora speaking. Um, it yes. seems like your slides are not moving. Can I take over your slides? 
um, and share your slides. Okay, it's fine then, please. Um, on, uh, can you just stop sharing and on which yeah. slide are you now? Um, slide five, I think, or four, yeah. Wait, on the okay. stage, yes. Okay, yes, just hold on. So slide five, please. please. Oh, five, is it that one? <laughs> Professor, is this the slide that you are on? No, that's uh, three. This is Move three. another two, Dora. Ask Is it that one? Well, now we also have one, like I see. Sorry, I seems like I'm making it worse. Sorry for that. That's fine. Um, now you've gone for the back, so you have to go back um, to to five, five, five or fourteen actually. That one. Yes, this one. Yes. Okay. Um, is that what everybody can see now? Yes, I can see. I can. I can see this now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, Dora. We can see. Okay. Thank you, colleague. Sorry for the interruption, Prof. Sorry. Continue. No, it's fine. I think it's technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, apologies. So I think from what I was saying um, before um, the second man came in, what I was trying to say is that publishers are. It would appear that publishers are benefited more than. Than, um, than scholars who are actually creating this knowledge that is being disseminated. And society has been put in the situation where they actually have to engage in what I would term as double dipping, where they have to still fund the universities and still commit funds towards having access to knowledge that we're being, we're disseminating in the society. And from the table, the, the article by uh, the Spitzman on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that journal prices have actually risen uh, or considered to have risen in a manner that outpaces inflation by 250% over the past 30 years. So that shows that most of the publishing houses are actually smiling to the banks at the detriment of, of, of society uh, and, 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 and scholars in, in the university. Next slide, please. So uh, could you go to slide five? This next slide. Okay. Uh, okay. So here, uh, when we talk about, for us as academics, what we actually get is usually the impact. We talk about impact. We talk about um, we're assessed. The outcome of our or the quality of our publications are assessed from an impact perspective. What is the impact of what we publish? And how do we achieve those impacts? How do we arrive at those impacts? So the metrics for measuring impacts or parameters for measuring impacts have usually revolved around journal quality, have revolved around publication or article quality, where we're looking at the kind of citations that we have, and also things like personal or personal or developmental measures, like your H index that you have as a, as a, as a researcher. So judging from those parameters, it becomes obvious. The next is between the access, improved access to publications by society, uh, the scholars' quest for recognition, societal recognition, and self gratification as well. And society's expectations from universities can easily be discerned. So you'd see that there is an increasing need for perspective from the university's perspective and from the publishing house's perspective concerning what society desires. From our, from our research or from what we do in universities. And I'm happy we're talking about open access this week. However, this advocacy for open access research did not just start today. If we look at um, initiatives like the Budapest Open Access Initiative, it, as far back as to in 2002 or 20, 21 years ago, and they said that statement on open access publishing, which is also dated about 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago, and the Berlin Declaration of Open Access, we can see that there has been some move or traction in the past towards 
having or widening access to people or to society to actually engage with the studies or the research that we do within these ivory towers. And so open access is usually described as it's commonly described as a publication of scholarly material, which is freely available, um, digital and online, and often with less encumbering and copyright barriers for authors and users alike to enable actual engagement with what has been done. Next slide, please. Yeah, so research findings are actually meant for public consumption. And that is what science is all about. That is what science engagement is all about, has been propagated by most of the funding bodies that we have, both between South Africa and internationally. And we see, we tend to ask this question, if we limit access to a broader spectrum of society, the question would be, of what use would such discoveries that we make be if they are hidden from the intended audience and cannot be eventually put to use? And this, this leads us to something that I consider that is reported in the scriptures for, for those of us who are religious, where we talk about neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. And with this, you can see that there is need for us to continue to ensure that the good works that we do, the research that are being carried out in universities are accessible and, and by a broader spectrum of society. And this has been enabled by the emergence of digital technologies and improved networking capabilities. As such, we now have access to more articles and people are able to actually see what we do. People are actually able to critique what we do. And this has led to an improvement in the value or quality of what we send out to the community, to society. With this, we're able to see the impact of this uh, across the board. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So there are certain benefits that have been um, that accrue from open access publishing. Yeah, I think that's one slide back. Thanks. So there are uh, certain as uh, benefits that are accruing from open access publishing, and this was actually sourced from the work that was done by Boer at all in 2015. Here we see things like success factors, like success factors like democratization. So with this, we're having access, improving access to what we do, to the research or the knowledge that's being created in universities, regardless of income um, categorizations of users. We're also deepening the levels of diffusion of knowledge into all societal areas. So it's not just about high tech or low tech, but again, across board. We're also relying on, increasingly relying on education, okay, teaching these materials to teach and learn for teaching and learning purposes, according to the scientific state of art. Again, well, galvanizing citizen science participation of stakeholders who wouldn't ordinarily be interested in what we do as researchers. But now, because of the fact that open access has happened to all of us, it becomes easier for people to get access to this, to this knowledge, for people to exhibit behavioral changes or witness behavioral changes to drive, to drive uh, knowledge in a manner that is for the betterment of society. Again, for health purposes as well, it's leading to up-to-date information for doctors and patients alike. It's leading to, leading to research efficiency, it, where, where because of the fact that knowledge is openly accessible these days, increasingly accessible these days to many people, we ha have witnessed a decline in, in the duplication of research activities within contexts. We've also arrived at the top cutting age of research, thereby encouraging innovation. And we are sure, and the public is now being more confident or imposing more confidence in universities by um, relying on what is coming out from these universities in engendering or in making laws and policies for, for the community. Again, uh, something that applies to me is the issue of uh, interdisciplinarity. With open, increasing open access, we're able to build stronger networks, collaborative networks across board across disciplines, across geographical contexts, enhancing knowledge networks, our participation in these knowledge networks, particularly within a developing country context where self-help has become the norm rather than, um, rather than an exception. And we're also um, allowing for more publishers to have access to the market. Previously, this, the publication domain or publishing house domain was restricted to what we used to call the big three or big four. But now we have a lot, of, a lot more publishers coming in both a local context uh, within the context and within the broader global context. 
Next, please. Now, um, I understand that there are also misgivings about open access publishing. Um, one of the major challenges or major challenge, um, drawbacks of open access publishing has been the tendency for people to believe that or associate open access with spirit three journals. Now, that is um, one of the myths that has to be debunked because um, it is the fact that there are many spirit three journals that have come into the space and offer um, cheaper access to or reduce cost of prices for publishing. There are still opportunities uh, to publish open access with the big reputable journals, um, publishers that we have like Elsevier, like Springer, uh, even with Emerald. However, there are different approaches to this. For example, Emerald, um, Elsevier is on record as having 500 titles that are being published open access currently. So there are different approaches to open access. And we understand, for instance, when we talk about the cost issues, which uh, previous speakers have enunciated, we find out that it's not just, uh, we mustn't really go the gold access route, which is very, very expensive for most of, for most, for most researchers, particularly in the developing world context or in the global south. There are opportunities to publish using the green open access route. Um, even if it means the investor doesn't have this repository, we can always have or rely on other repositories like ResearchGate, but ensuring that we don't put off the actual or the eventual, pub, eventually published um, paper, but rather maybe an accepted version of this paper. And that is allowed. I do that a lot with some of my publications and people are able to assess them. But however, I have, I have to give control to who, or give access, permission to whoever is going to assess them. And there is also the perception that uh, open access publishing leads to reduce quality assurance. Um, and that is also not true. I think we'll talk about it in the next slide. Yeah, perhaps possibly for myself, I've had my papers, some of my publications or research studies or submissions rejected um, by this seemingly, um, uh, this open access journals like MDPI and all that for reasons that border on what is expected and the, percept the, the feedback that was received from a peer review process. So it's not it's not a given, like some would want to think that once it's been published open access, then it means that this idea of paying an APC that is outlandish for a publication to happen. And that would be an incentive for the publisher to publish whatever is not really of essence to the body of practice or the, to the knowledge community. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are some of the myths that are associated with, which I talked about debunking, um, some of the myths that surround open access publishing. Um, for instance, um, Super tries to, a study by Super tries to show us that open access publishing does not actually bypass quality peer review, like I had mentioned. It doesn't also try to reform, violate or abolish copyrights. You still have, the, 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 as an author, you're still expected to retain your copyrights uh, over some publications for, by, by some journal publishers, while others would ask for that copyright to be transferred to them. It doesn't also deprive royalty earning authors of legitimate income. Like, I, like um, Mr. Zwingler mentioned, I have written a couple of books and those books, I still receive royalty for them, even though one of them is open access now. Again, deny, it doesn't deny the reality of the costs that are associated with production of scientific works. Neither does it suppress academic freedom, rather it rather encourages academic freedom because I have potentials of looking at other studies that report on similar things or points of interest, and I can actually critique or try to, to, to look at what has the, the, the values that are driving that feedback that is coming out from the other paper or the other study. It, it doesn't relax rules against plagiarism, neither does it support boycotting of any kind of literature or publisher. So, one of the challenges is that open access hasn't or doesn't guarantee universal access because uh, like you all know, we still have challenges that have to do with censorship, have to do with language and handicap access, as well as connectivity barriers, particularly in the developing country context. On, on the right hand side, there are some of the other myths that have been put up across by tenants at all, uh, particularly about preprints. Uh, some of us believe that, like uh, the previous speaker had mentioned, the competition that we have um, or that we experience among academics where people tend to hide what they're doing, the methodologies and the findings, because they don't want it to be stolen by others. Now we see with the democratization of knowledge, 
that has happened. You can have your preprints out there and you can get feedback even before with which to improve the quality of the publication before it gets eventually published. So where most of these publishers are democratizing the space where we don't just rely on feedback from two or three reviewers that are statutorily appointed, but again, you could tend to get feedback from people who are critical stakeholders within your community of practice and even from our host or from the community that you're intending to provide solutions to a problem that might be there. We're also seeing that there is um, emphasis on issue about copyright transfer that is required. This is not really procedural because some publishing houses would allow you to retain your copyright while some might ask for it to be transferred. So it's not really a given that it must be transferred and, and once it's transferred, the, the author doesn't have any right to them anymore. Again, the approval by peer review proves that you can trust a research article, but that is not really um, true. That is not really the case because remember that the appointment of reviewers is subjective, uh, usually subjective thing on conventional traditional journals. So when we go open access and when we look at issues about preprints or the need for preprints, for example, the feedback that you get, you must remember that preprints are not really final article. The articles on the process. So you tend to get feedback from community and people who are outside this um, remit of, or, or this circle of, of uh, appointed reviewers to give you feedback. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, advantages that come with uh, publishing open access as against these advantages that we've mentioned. And this myths that have been presented here show that that have been debunked by previous authors by Super and tenants show that there is some significance that is agreeable from publishing open access. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a personal reflection. I think um, this is like my profile um, from ResearchGate and from um, Google Scholar. The QR code on your right is to see, it, it, you could take a picture of that to assess it, to see the articles or the kind of manuscripts that are in my profile. With this, you would see that I've gained the most citations for articles that I've published open access. And since 2017, I have moved, um, I had no H index in 2017, and today I have 12, H index of 12. And again, I published between 2017 and I've gotten about 670 citations for my publications. Whilst I understand that this is a very, this is one of the ways, a very nuanced way of judging impact. Um, I believe that if you, if authors within your community of practice or knowledge community are citing your work, um, that implies that it's of relevance to them and they are, it shows that they're able to assess it and they're able to use that as a scaffold to build new knowledge or to create more or come about newer inventions or innovation in the practice. And that is, this is one of the reasons why I tend to support open access publications. And I noticed that there's a challenge, um, again, going back to the issue of cost, one of the things that I've done within the period, my period of employing the academia is to leverage on my broader networks. So oftentimes um, I have colleagues who are working in countries like Sweden in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries and in China where there are um, incentives or where there are blanket um, approvals for publishing for public APCs um, costs for publishing open access. And we tend to leverage on those, those connections and those possibilities or opportunities in those claims in co through co-authoring papers and through um, carrying out um, jointly funded projects across the world. Next slide, please. Yeah, so to conclude, I believe that um, open access publication has come to stay and it can only be improved upon and um, particularly with the emerging framework for open access and the uh, um, inclusion of the, 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 the directory for open access journals on the approved BEDS list. Again, it, we understand that it remains a credible business model for enabling better engagement with scholarly research outputs in a cost-effective manner. It's as is the case with every new business. It might be very expensive at this point, but when we broaden or widen access, I believe that this APC costs will start coming down, particularly for us in, in mid-income countries and low-income countries. I've benefited from this transition as a researcher, and this is evident in what I've shown. And, and if you have assessed the QR code or my um, profile via the QR code, you'd see that this is very evident. However, we need an increased number of information sessions just like this to improve the level of awareness and acceptance among relevant stakeholder groups to better um, 
propagates this gospel of open access publishing and open science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, um, for the for the for the uh, for the very informative information that you have uh, just shared uh, with us. Um, I know you you quoted uh, in the in the holy book when you said uh, you cannot light a light and then put under the under the table. You have to put it uh, on top of the table so that it can. Uh, uh, it can help anyone in, in the room, uh, which uh, really, Prof, it's, 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 it's very true. Because I'm also uh, taken to the, to the Holy Book, which, which says um, the, 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 the best things normally are free. Uh, the best things are free. So, but then the notion of saying uh, everything has to be uh, under, behind the, the paywall, uh, we we are not so sure where where is it uh, emanating uh, from because if you can check we are currently having the electricity that we are paying uh, but then we we are not sure whether uh, at the end of the day we'll be having the electricity uh, so so but then we've got the sun that is uh, we are definitely sure that is going to come and then we even we can even predict the time where what time the the sun will come out so what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, uh, Best things are free in life in general. However, there is a notion of that we have to, everything has to be behind the, the, uh, the, the, the paywall. So I've got a, a, a question which, is a, a, which goes with the, with the comment, Prof. Uh, in terms of the, of the uh, in terms of the meat, uh, do, we, do we know, uh, that is surrounding the, the open access. Do we know where, where the, the, the myths uh, emanate uh, from? And then what is the agenda or what is the motive behind the myth that we, we find ourselves uh, that we have to, to deal with uh, uh, such a, a myth? And also in terms of the, of the, of the researchers, uh, research, uh, researchers uh, uh, fraternity, how does the, the myth play uh, the role of uh, researchers not being able or not willing or maybe reluctant uh, to uh, to publish on the open access. Uh, thank you, Prof. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I uh, to start with, I agree with the comment that the best things in life are actually free. Um, however, you must understand that there has been a transition from 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 life as it is to life as it ought to be. Um, and we also have to understand the fact that uh, there's a growing population and everybody's also trying to become more entrepreneurial. And that has also been the case with the, with the publishing houses that have moved beyond trying to widen or broaden the horizon for science towards profit, profit, profit making or profiteering in a legal way. So that, I think that is one of the things that has sustained when we start looking at the fact that we must also make ends meet as publishers because in the, in the previous time, in previous era, these publishers, like I said, had dominion over this landscape for publishing research. And with this, there was a badge, okay? You're either publishing with Emerald, you're either publishing with this as, as a researcher who wants to grow in a particular body of practice, in a particular community of practice. And that had led the, the, the research fraternity to align with this, this, for this actual journal titles or publishing publishing houses, for example, for us in the built environment, there are some journals that, if you want to become internationally visible and renowned, you must publish with these journals. And this is a reputation that has been built over time. So these journals would not really want to allow or freely hand over this competition or the, this privilege, I would say, to to competitors easily. And that is one of the things that I sustain. And some of us as researchers have lived to this legacy of as being associated with particular publishers uh, or particular journal titles, okay? And irrespective of the fact that it might be not pay, it might be not, not support open access in the, in the first part. But now as things have evolved, because of the fact that community, like I said in my presentation, community is now demanding for more. That you cannot, people are becoming more, are becoming wiser for, and asking well, what has happened to the investments that we've made. What has happened to community engagement? What has happened to the fact that we most of us in the academic fraternity are doing what is 
called Blue Sky Research, which has no impact, direct impact on the host communities. We have also started now transiting from just being centers of knowledge creation to being champions of societal change, to being, uh, you know, through the kind of people we graduate, through the kind of outputs that come out from our research, through the kind of commercialization potentials that lie with our research. So with that, we need to now start subjecting our research to public scrutiny. We need to now start asking people to actually provide feedback, input, not just reserved for academics in the review process that, that journals do, but leaving it out for everybody to actually make an input. And that is what has sustained this increasing transition or trend movement towards open access. So I think I've answered your question. Yes, yes, absolutely, uh, Prof. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, colleagues, uh, I, will, I will open an opportunity if there's anyone uh, who want to ask a uh, Prof a uh, question, uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask the question. Mr. Jeffrey, you have your question in the comment box, the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay, let me quickly go there. Uh, I've seen it. Um, if you don't oh, mind. okay. Yes, you can go ahead, yeah. Prof. And then answer. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a question that is asking about um, what my view is about um, comparing traditional publishing and the new publishing model that is sort of open access. Well, I think I think there's not a lot that is different. For instance, um, when you're going to traditional publish as a researcher who spends time, I, I, I'm on the editorial review board of more than seven journals and seven international journals, and I do a lot of reviews per week. In, in some years, like for example, this year, I'm not to exaggerate, I've done about 47 reviews for the Journal of Cleaner Production this year alone. And, and in the event where it's not allowed to be open access, my time, that I use in carrying out those review, these review processes are totally unpaid for, but just justifies my presence or relevance within the body of practice or the knowledge community. But now the publisher derives an immense benefit by restricting access and, and charging fees for access to this, this publication. So what we're trying to push from our side, unlike when we look at it from the open access ones, it becomes, there are some open access journals in Wiley and all that are not charging any money. So we mustn't really constitute to say open access has to do with costs or has to do with payment of APC, APC um, charges. In most places, in most, some of these journals, we don't have that, we have the options. And like I mentioned, the new publishing model, when I talked about the, the green access route and the golden route, the green access route still allows you, if your university has a repository, to put in most of your, your your paper up to the point of acceptance, the paper that's not been published, but has been accepted, you still allow that right to, you still hold the copyright and you're expected to upload that on your institutional repository. Although you might have an embargo period of a year or more or six months, but at least that allows that as that that allows people to assess that, that publication at no cost at all. So we mustn't construe. So for me, I believe that in a manner that makes it mutually beneficial to both parties, the academic part, academic practice, and the publishing house and communities as well. The new publishing models are actually better or fare better in that regard compared to traditional um, traditional publishing models, particularly as it concerns things like um, the peer review process. I've, I've made allusions to the fact that when we go through the what we call the preprint, we have we usually have feedback. There was a, a study we did on COVID in 2020. And it had more than it had more than uh, one thousand reads in, in less than a day, and we got feedback. My co-authors and I got feedback that we used to improve on the paper before it was eventually published. We held this the feedbacks and we incorporated into the paper when it had gone through the first round of review, and that has led that for today has about one hundred and forty six citations, and it was just published in twenty twenty. So that's my and that's something that doesn't necessarily happen with traditional traditional publishing model. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, I'm not sure if there's another question in the house. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
I think there is one by Dr. Moshe um, also too. That Dr. Oh, Dr. yes, Dr. yes. Yeah. So I think Please he, unmute he, and go ahead. Yeah, so it's more about, um, I said the question is more about why can't you have a universal standard for publishing, like open access? But like I said in my presentation, that we have open access does not deny the fact that there are, there are costs associated with publishing even for the domain registration, even for having to host the domain that has these publications where we can actually, uh, these publications have been hosted. So there must be a fee. So we must have to maybe work out a model for paying for those fees. If we're going to go the non-profit route, it's also a possibility, but there must be fees that are associated with publishing open access. So we can't really have um, a universal access unless somebody's paying for it. And like I gave an example in the Scandinavian countries, there are a lot of there are a lot of like in Norway, Sweden, and all that. There are governments are busy, and even in the Netherlands, government is busy providing that support. So they wouldn't be paying as much as we pay for APC fees because they are actually subscribing to a particular cohort of universities that provide a blanket fee or a blanket payment towards this. So thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, we really uh, appreciate and also uh, for for making time uh, to, to come and share uh, this uh, valuable information with us. We really uh, appreciate. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Prof. Thank you for having me, colleagues. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, we we are moving uh, because we are we are we are behind the, a bit uh, of time. So uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Hikulas. Uh, I believe it's Mr. Hikulas uh, Kombrink. is a database uh, scientist with a specialization in the applied data science and the autonomous uh, design making in the uh, artificial intelligence. He was appointed the interim co-director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Future in the University of the Free State. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yuka. You can uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to see if my sound quality is there and whether you can hear me if I'm audible. Yes, it's absolutely clear and we can also see your slide. <laughs> Fantastic. This is, this is good. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. And, and what a wonderful, um, if I can just say, the presentations up to now, what a wonderful um, uh, way in which it's been facilitated. So thank you so much to the facilitators and the organizers as well. Um, we are going to, um, we are both, uh, myself and Professor Katunga David, are the interim co-directors for the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures at the University of the Free State. And we're really just going to talk about big data and open science and more or less what that looks like. So in a nutshell, and I think a lot of us are well aware, um, let's just define some of these terms a little bit. You know, so what is data? So when, when a lot of people talk about data, what, what are we talking about? And we're really talking about quantities, characters, symbols, sounds, images, text, numbers, spreadsheets, tabular data, structured data, unstructured data, on which different operations are performed. A good example is the data that is currently being used, the audio information, the visual information, the tabular information, the half files to make this bi-directional conversation we're having at the moment possible. And it really has to do with the way in which we store information, transmit information over digital platforms um, in the form of certain electrical and computational signals so that it can be recorded on magnetic, optical, mechanical recording devices, so such as computers or tablets or certain digital information and communication technologies. Now, this definition of data is a little bit more advanced than what some of us have worked with in our lives. Because up until recently, uh, and this is just based on quite a variety of, of, of publications that we've had in this domain, a lot of people construe data to be very specific to tabular data. So what you see in a spreadsheet, but in reality, spreadsheets are only 1% of the data that are available in the big sphere of, of the data on digital devices. And this is important 
because the next step is big data. So, so what is big data? So some might think it's a lot of this original data, and you might be true. Um, however, it has to deal with the integration of information. If I can give you an example, this recording and this conversation taking place right now has to do with big data. It's a big data task. You are looking at the screen that I'm sharing from my computer. Hopefully, you have a little block with my face on it. Hopefully, you can hear the sound of my voice. And in the background, a lot of this information is being recorded, stored, and backed up at the same time. And all three of these data types need to work together in order for you as a user to gain the full immersion of this experience. And this is just a one-directional example. In reality, when we work with apps, especially apps that use artificial intelligence, there's a bi-directional communication that takes place. You, as the user communicating to the app, and the app communicating to you. And the analytics or the analysis that need to support the decision-making of the artificial intelligence behind it need to work in sync with this. And so big data are extremely large data sets that can be analyzed, and I think this is important, that can be analyzed to reveal patterns, trends, associations, especially when it relates to human behavior and the interaction we have with other humans and machines in digital spaces. Now, the reason why I'm prefacing this entire presentation based on what is big data and more specifically what is data is really where we're going in terms of open science and why this is important. So what does big data allow? Well, it allows for collaboration because the big data space is inherently complex. You don't just analyze big data if you're a data scientist. You need social scientists. You need librarians. You need people who can do information management and data management. You need people who work with user inter interfaces, consumer scientists. You deal with people who work with social science. And so the, truly to unpack a problem requires an interdisciplinary team. And so what the positive side is, it allows for more collaborations between researchers and institutions, which is very important. Um, more researchers can come on board with a particular project, so that's important. Um, and we're solving problems faster, a lot faster than we used to before. And this is quite an important uh, part because in the past when you had single authored research, the rate of knowledge discovery was directly proportional to the rate of knowledge discovery of the individual working on the project. What we're seeing now is an exponential logarithmic increase in knowledge production where strong interdisciplinary teams of strong in, that comprise out of strong individuals tend to make the overarching meaning uh, much deeper, much faster. There's also a drive towards internationalization. So you might find that the expertise you're looking for might be situated all over the world. And what um, information and communication technologies have allowed is a stronger need for internationalization in terms of research. And as I said, faster knowledge and skill share. So this is important. And this is why open science is a valuable thing. But instead of just focusing on the utopia and the positive side, there are unfortunately negative ramifications of this. So collabor collaboration is sometimes very vague. So who does what, where, and how? And, and this is kind of linked to this idea of the third point, which is intellectual property. So if you co-create, who owns what? And should there be ownership? Should it be shared freely? And if it's shared freely, how do you gain a return on investment? What's the actual value proposition? Is the value proposition inherently for society? And therefore, uh, society needs to fund this kind of research? Or is the value proposition based on capital gain, third stream income? And if that's the case, how much of a market share or profit share do different organizations have when they engage with open science? Researchers do not always contribute toward a shared vision. This is an unfortunate reality that, that we have seen over, over the years, is that not everyone has the shared vision. So if the vision is for the greater good or public good, you might find that not everyone sees it that way. Some people might see the capital gain component of it, the potential for commercialization, and not really the bigger picture. And the moment you have these conflicting visions, it tends to cause a lot of disruptions given this climate. Another important challenge is more money and cost for digital assets. So 
typical research projects get funded because you've got a very specific research question and then you need certain equipment and human capital to support that particular research question. With big data, you need quite a large amount of infrastructure to be able to manage the monoliths of information that are available as well as get the decent amount of computational power to be able to interpret that information. So it's not just about writing the, the best algorithm, but it's also about finding the right infrastructure which these algorithms can run on given the size of the data. And this is uh, sometimes a bit challenging if you're doing research and you just have your laptop computer. So some of the research projects that, that we work in, we deal with um, high performance computing and high performance computing clusters because we cannot do the analysis or the interpretation just on our computers alone. And finally, knowledge sharing is prevalent among the willing, but it can't be forced. So there are different schools of thought where people traditionally would share information openly because the knowledge generation is part of the knowledge pool for the sake of growing the knowledge rather than um, benefiting an individual or a particular agenda. But this but this vision and this open vision of being able to share freely so that we can advance the field, so that we can generate better knowledge, isn't always shared among all the collaborators. And this is a challenging part because we don't always know where people stand with, with this particular thing. So I just wanted to preface what big data allows. Now, at the University of the Free State, we are from part of the ICDF, which is the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures. And through the ICDF, the U University of the Free State really aims to create a full digital immersion through the development of expertise in both social scientific and natural sciences, technical competencies of the digital in its entirety. And it really strives to create a platform that deals with this collaborative co-creation where we have social scientists, experts from humanities, data science, natural science, engineers, health science, to really interact with industry and interact with government in a way that can drive a digital future for the benefit of society, economic growth and prosperity. Now, those are three different constructs. So sometimes projects do have all three of those elements in and sometimes they do not, but it's very important that we delineate that and that we make it from the onset very clear where the intellectual property is, what the agenda is. And then finally, the ICDF really wants to take the lead in terms of this type of socially responsive, relevant digital futures. A lot of the work that is done within the ICDF and within different centers has to do with data science for social impact and data science for social good. And the more centers we have in, in the country and, and in the world that have that vision, the stronger we can drive the use case and the argument that we need to create responsive technologies and use big data responsibly for the betterment of society. Just wanted to give you an example of how important open science is and how important um, big data are in a, a very specific use case. So what you're looking at on the screen is, is the use case of where agriculture was. So agriculture, you used to have a, a bunch of crops and lands, agriculture experts working in the field. Nowadays, you have the exact same traditional agriculture processes, but it's augmented with digital technologies and big data technologies. So a farmer traditionally would put on his boots and be in the field. A farmer would do the exact same thing now, but he would have a tablet, a cell phone, a smart device in his hand, monitoring and evaluating different things that are helping him make decisions or her make decisions in the field. And what this allowed was a lot of data to be collected based on agri processes and the agriculture value chain within the field. So this is this is where the big data argument started in agriculture. But as time went on, it really evolved and emerged into different fields. Now, I'm just giving a use case in terms of agriculture, but I need to be clear that this is applicable in healthcare, education, and a variety of other domains, such as smart grid technologies, et cetera, where this exact same model, where a lot of data was created to be able to monitor and evaluate processes, gave rise to some of the most innovative uh, use cases based on this big data. So once you collect all of this information, what do you do with it? And ultimately, this is where agriculture is heading. So on this slide, you can see the exact same crops that are taking place on the first farm, but all the data from that farm informed exactly 
how the crops grow in the most optimal conditions. And what you're looking at is an underground farm that produces the exact same as what the above ground farm used to produce with less space and with a higher accuracy because now the elements, the weather, the pressure, the water, the nutrient conditions, all of it is monitored and controlled based on the big data exercise. This is just one example of how a digital twin and digital twin technology can be used to optimize processes and for the betterment of society because now you have less environmental damage in, in some regards and in some regard you have more um, and we're not going to talk about e-waste but e-waste is one of the projects that we are building up in, in the space because unfortunately the digital isn't all utopian there are uh, ramifications and side effects to the digital adoption of, of these things but ultimately open science allows data from a variety of different sources to come together so that you have a multitude of different experts working together in an interdisciplinary space to truly make this work. And so to wrap up, just wanted to point out that for data science and digital futures and open science to work, you really need what we call a data science minimum. So you need all of these skills in a team. You need people who are special specialists on visualizations, team players, lifelong learning, people who have strong communication skills, machine learning skills, people who can work with data, wrangling and munging and pre-processing, coding skills, mathematical skills, and ethical skills. This is the minimum that you need in an open science space when you work with a collaborative team. So you, you really can only do the projects once you have a team of people together from multiple disciplines to, to make the work work. And so some of the problems that we sit with in data science and open science is about understanding intent of the researchers. It's about understanding the comprehension of what it is that we're trying to achieve. Between different fields, these intents and comprehensions might differ. The topological data analysis, I mean, it might fundamentally differ between fields, the interpretation of it and how that works. And also creating virtual environments for agents or artificial intelligent decision makers so that we can apply reinforcement learning in real world applications. Notoriously powerful algorithms, but very difficult to create, very difficult to implement. And ultimately, we want to integrate different social and non-social scientific disciplines in order to make this work. So what open science has allowed for is really truly this data science minimum, this incredible team that is needed, but it does come with its challenges. And as a result, Big data is incredibly important in open science, but the way in which we govern, manage, and work together, that will be the secret source and the key to the kinds of innovations we make in the future. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Combrink. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the information that you have uh, uh, shared uh, with us. Uh, I believe, uh, because most of us, we, we are uh, just a librarian, uh, and then we don't understand we, we, what is happening behind the scene. Uh, so what you have shared with us, we have given us a, at least an idea of what is happening behind the scene and the work that we are doing uh, in, uh, in bringing all these uh, uh, different uh, uh, parts together so that we as a librarian can be able to uh, to access the information and readily available uh, 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 as such. I think that was a, a very uh, informative uh, session, especially to me as a librarian and also to my colleagues to understand what is happening uh, behind uh, the scene. Uh, colleagues, uh, is there any question uh, for, uh, for Mr. Combrink? Uh, please raise your hand and then, uh, okay, I saw there is a question. Uh, I will start with, with the, the way how I, I, I see them. Uh, so yes, uh, Cornel, uh, please unmute and then go ahead. And then I saw uh, maybe it's also, uh, it's got a question uh, in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sengu. Um, Arkelos, thank you so much for that that presentation. Um, I was just wondering, um, or oh, I'm just curious. Um, I know it's maybe difficult to answer, but is there a specific project, a big data project, um, that you found very impactful, one of your own, or even one that you collaborated on? 
Yes, I, I can answer this freely. Thank you so much for that question. So I think I have four big data projects that are publicly available. And this is going to sound cocky, but you can Google my name and surname, and then you will find the projects and the work that we did on there. And I, I didn't mean this in a, in, 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 a, in a funny way, but there is one particular project that truly stands out. And that was the COVID-19 project um, that we ran in the country. So let me just give you some context. Um, the University of Pretoria is the custodian of this data. Okay, so it's done on a public forum uh, through GitHub, a public warehouse, and it's all the COVID-19 data that was stored in the country. Myself and a few other collaborators underneath the leadership of Professor Bukosi Maribate. Professor Maribate is a professor in computer science at the um, uh, EBIT faculty at the University of Pretoria. He started the COVID-19 repository for the country. And to date, it is the most cited, um, I think, and I stand on a correction, but something like 68 citations within uh, one year um, for COVID-19 because this data set was used for all the public modeling consortiums, including the books that were published uh, by Tzilisi, Professor Tzilisi Mahwala, and a variety of other people in this consortium. Within this one data set, just this one data set, there were more than 15 different funded grants as a result of this data set. There is collaborations between more than 33 universities and private research institutions to make the data in this data set possible. I know this because I'm one of the champions uh, uh, underneath this data set, and you can find the publications and you can find the data set available online. More than 40, 40 apps and websites were built on the premise of this one data set. And it started with an idea to collect good quality information and get a team together. Currently, there's more than 160 people, academics, non-academics, members of the public that contributed towards this one data set. And the data set keeps growing. And the reason why I'm giving you this use case is when we started this data set, we didn't know that it was going to turn into a big data set. We just thought it was going to be the number of cases in the country, and that was it. It has gotten to the point where every single part of the healthcare system in South Africa was mapped out. Every hospital, the amount of available beds that were gazetted in each hospital, the names, numbers of the CEOs of the hospital, should you need to get into contact with them, the geolocations of them. Apps were created pinpointing all the hospitals, the type of hospitals and the specializations of the clinics in the entire South Africa online so that if anyone with an internet connection wants to know where the nearest healthcare facility is or are, they can go onto this website and do it. But probably the most fundamental thing that, that we gained from this data set was it was the first dashboard that the ministry, the president, and the ministerial advisory committee used for the first two months of the COVID-19 outbreak in the country. And so this data set really had a national and international impact. And that's the point I'm trying to make, is that the example that you asked for, there are many, but this is one that I can confidently say keeps growing over time and has been of immense value because of the level of collaboration, the amount of collaborators, and the types of products that came from just this one data set. I hope that answers your question in terms of a use case. No, perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cornel. Uh, maybe it's, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pepe Zungu. Um, Mr. Kombrek, um, the example that you used in terms of agriculture, where we showed us the difference between what is happening now, the traditional, if I can refer to it as a traditional farming, and the future farming, one uh, wonders whether uh, we are solving one problem and creating another problem. <laughs> you already know where I'm going to in terms of losses of jobs. Is the center busy capacitating, identifying people who can be capacitated so that they you take them along to the future? Thank you. I thank you for asking, uh, just the same as Cornell, for both of you for asking good questions. So thank you for the previous question and thank you for the current question. So um, I think the future and the digital future requires a mind shift. So let me impart that mind shift onto you. 
traditionally, people thought that automation replaces jobs. And that is true. Automation does replace jobs. Automation replaces repetitive jobs. Automation replaces repetitive workforces, which means that your level of unskilled work that is repetitive goes down. However, automation should not replace people. If I have a company and I require 10 people to run my company and nine of their jobs can be automated, I have a choice. I can A, fire all nine people and replace their job with machines, which is a terrible idea because human beings are good at innovation and creativity. Or I can keep all nine people, replace their jobs with automation and automated technologies. And now my 10-man company can do the work of 20 men. And I say men, not the gender, men are talking about a human. Automation increases the human capital of a company. The mind shift that we need to go into is the idea that some of the employees that will be working for a company might be fictitious and digital, meaning machines might be part of the workforce. They already are to an extent, and we can argue that, but eventually things that human beings were supposed to do is going to be done by machines and humans. What human beings are really good with is creativity. So in our digital futures, we imagine the human component remaining because we want to tap into the innovation and the creativity of, of people. The challenge is that the current way in which current management and company sees it is maximize profit, minimize human capital, because human capital is quite financially uh, intensive in, in a business. And so what we are trying to advocate for is taking the agriculture example. We will have less need less service workers on the farm. But that doesn't mean we need less monitoring and evaluation experts. What it does mean is we need to upskill our farm workers so that the level of work that they do becomes a bit more sophisticated. And we need to take everyone along for the journey. So the more digitally immersive the company, the bigger the outputs, because the staff complement increases based on virtual staff and, and real staff, but the task of the real staff is to become more innovative and less repetitive. I hope that answers your question. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, my peers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Comring. Uh, I'm not seeing any question uh, on the on the on the side. Okay, it was uh, on the chat. Uh, it was it is an in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, a comment from Cornell. Yes, so uh, with that being said, uh, uh, Mr. Combring, uh, I would like to uh, to thank you so uh, so much for being selfless and making time uh, to come and share this uh, valuable information uh, with uh, us. So we're looking forward to, uh, to have any other engagement uh, whenever uh, we need you. Uh, thank you and thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just uh, putting it out there that it is incredibly important that we have an open book and Cornell is is, is such a, a an important part of this as well as um, yes. all the different librarians we work with and we have an open book. We, as time goes on, libraries actually and library information services play such an important part in terms of governance, in terms of data curation, in terms of data management, to the extent that eventually one can argue that you cannot do one without the other. And that's the type of ecosystem we need to work in, in, in building together. So I just wanted to put that out there that I've had many conversations with librarians, especially traditional librarians, where there might be this, you know, this perception that, you yes, know, we, yes. you know, you're being replaced in some way, shape or form. That's not the case. It's quite the opposite. The yes. field had evolved so much that it became more sophisticated. The role of the librarian now is completely different to the role of the librarian 10, 20 years ago. And, and, and I would just like to say it's an honor for me to be in your presence. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, are, we have come to an end of our session. I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Charlie uh, to, to do the, the voice uh, of thanks and closing 
uh, our, se our session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Charlie, over to you. Thank you, thank you, colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to our, our speakers for the day. Um, they, I think for those of us who were able to, to attend yesterday's mm -hmm. Chelsea Liasa inaugural Open Science Seminar, uh, one of the speakers, what, in the, what they indicated is that we, we are not tapping on our colleagues, especially academics, uh, that have, uh, 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 are doing quite a lot in, in the open science field. And, and today is a testimony to that. Mm -hmm. um, as you, you, you might have seen that we deliberately uh, as an organizing committee did not uh, have librarians uh, speaking on what we are doing, but we brought in mainly uh, from the people in the field, uh, the academics and those who are supporting research within the academic field to, to be the speaker so that we, we show that um, we, we, we already have champions. They, they, they may, we may not know them, and, and they might not be visible, but there are quite a lot of champions within, within the academic that we must uh, link up with them. And, 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 and so thank you very much. Maybe it would be proper to actually acknowledge the committee because they, they, these are their ideas. These, these are the ideas that, that make this issue, um, to make this, uh, this symposium to be what it is. Maybe I have to mention them by name, um, starting with those from uh, Central University of Technology. Uh, maybe it would be proper for colleagues when I when I thank you, introduce you. You can switch on your camera. I know that some of you might be in the same group in in one venue. Um, it, it will be fine. Uh, Miss Dora Ackerman. Uh, Emmanuel Zungu and Kate Le. Um, thank you, colleagues, and thank you for the platform. Um, we 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 are zooming uh, from CUT. Um, you know that if it was UFS, it would be uh, people soft. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much, CUT colleagues. Um, and then from uh, Salt Plaki. Um, Constance Shawagatipa and Noglunga. Um, okay, uh, maybe my my view. Let me see. Gala review. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, colleagues from Salt Lake. I I I see you are. You are camera shy, but um, <laughs> um, but thank you very much. And and from the University of the Free State, uh, Cornell Nambita, um, and um, Kaulile. Uh, okay, and then the <laughs> okay, I see other people are. are um, Stuff riding and Nambita. Thank, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, uh, you might be seeing us from a different environment. We are joining you from from Kwakwa, um, where we we as part of UFS we, we are launching some of the open access initiatives within the UFS. Um, thank you very much, colleagues, for your for your for your effort and 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 I I think. It was well done. I know that most of you didn't sleep well last night. You had some running stomachs, and in the morning at five o'clock, when you uh, when one of our speaker appeared to be missing in action, um, and uh, I was glad um, uh, when when they were saying she's on the air, and then with those five exclamation mark. Thank you very much, colleagues, for for all your effort. 
I know that as a chair of the committee, most of the time I was not in because I was I was mostly involved in the arrangement of the Liasa Skexal conference, and you guys held the committee together on your own. And 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 most of the time, I would like to say thank you very much. And and a special word of thanks to Dr. Knox. I didn't know that um, Dr. Knox um, Although she's traveling overseas, she made sure that she set time aside to speak to 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 us. And and we we highly appreciate and 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 also our sincere thanks to Miss Menya um, for the presentation from Sol Plaki and Dr. Bankole Awuzi, um, Professor Associate Professor Bankusi and Hercules Combrink um, for the most informative presentations. Um, as I've already indicated that we are quite excited because as you can see from the lineup, none of those speakers that we have on the lineup were librarians. It, wa it was to show that they are champions that we can speak to. And lastly, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I, at one stage you were, you were around 90 something in attendance. Um, maybe we can, take this opportunity and switch on our cam, cameras, all of us, so that I can acknowledge you in person. Can we all switch on our cameras? Um, thank you, thank you, nice faces, nice. Some familiar, some unfamiliar, beautiful people. Um, I hope uh, colleagues are taking photos. Um, uh, taking photos, it will be nice uh, to have this, to remember our first open science is the three institution. Um, thank you very much colleagues. You were a wonderful audience and I hope from here we, are, we will be building. I, I, I still have that vision that I mentioned yesterday that as a country, we must not um, stretch ourselves thin, but we must celebrate this whole week as a country. So hopefully, Chelsea, uh, I, I know that two direct, three directors should be here. Uh, when Chelsea, when your colleagues at Chelsea Executive bring this thing up about us collaborating at the national level, you should support this. I want us to see, I want us as a, as a profession, because uh, we, we tend to now fight for the speakers, we tend to fight for time because we only have five days and we've got 26 institutions. So therefore we cannot all of us be able to organize such events. Fortunately for the, for, for the central universities, we have come together as three universities, but other universities, as you will see on the invites are going alone. And with those few words, I would like to say thank you very much to every one of you. I hope you have a wonderful day and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.